all right, everybody? So it's time to start with the tutorial. Uh, yeah, I'd like to welcome you, everybody, to this tutorial about the poly loop optimizer. So we had a buff before, so some of you may have heard what poly is. And, but this time, we're really going to go more into the implementation details of poly. How does it look internally? What, what are the different components of poly? Um, and we kind of want to address three different things. First of all, uh, poly uses a mathematical model, uh, which may not be uh, known to all of you. So we will give a brief introduction to this model. Um, for a lot of people, this model might even not be so relevant. So we keep this re introduction really brief. There was an earlier tutorial at, at uh, the LVM conference in the US. So if you're interested in more background on the polyhedral model, um, you could, for example, look in, into this but, uh, tutorial. Or you'd write me emails, and there are a lot of pointers I can give you. But I try to keep this mathematical part, this tutorial, pretty low. And the second part is really be, how can I use poly? What are the different command line options? How, what are the components? What, what, how can I understand what poly is doing? Um, how can I get data out of poly? And then in the last part of the tutorial, um, we're going to look into the implementation of poly. So we actually look what are the different components, classes, programming interfaces. Um, what are the user interfaces um, you can somehow control from inside poly? And then we'll also get a, give a couple of examples where poly can actually be used and what kind of transformations we can apply. So the first part of the tutorial will be given by me. Um, Johannes will give the second part of the tutorial, and we are, we are, we are very glad for Zeno's help with um, some of the slides and some of the development of this tutorial. So let's get started. Um, let's see, let's get some feedback. Who already knows about polyhedral modeling? All right. So. As I said, the introduction in this area will be reasonably short, and for everybody else who does not know it yet, um, yeah, we'll see that. Um, so I just start to give right, just right into the um, model. It's very, very simple. It's really you just have, the only thing we care about are loops, mostly at least. And so the question is, um, what would be a convenient way to, to represent loop nests? Um, loop codes such that you can, at a higher level, reason about them and, and, and transform them, optimize them. This means transformation in many different ways. You can change the order that, that they are improved for cache locality. You can introduce parallelism. You can introduce vector instructions. Or if you want to develop um, a compiler or an optimizer for a heterogeneous system, it actually may mean you want to separate the instructions. You want to partition computation between different devices, different accelerator threads, um, you want to um, change the layout or the location of data. And um, such kind of optimizations we try to perform starting from a simple loop nest. So what you observe is it's really a simple loop nest. And the easiest thing you could do with such a loop nest to understand this is just to execute it. So as you see, you go through the loop nest, you, you fix an n that you actually can execute it. And then you see that the values of i and j just evolve throughout the execution of your program. So this is very, very simple, right? And so how can we get a mathematical model from this? And this is just if we keep doing the iteration, the execution again, and we just write down the, the, the points that I executed, we actually see that the, those to, two loops open a two-dimensional vector space. So each individual computation that is performed can be seen as a point in this two-dimensional vector space. And in general, it's not a two-dimensional vector space, but each loop surrounding the actual computation gives you one dimension of the vector space. So in this case, the, the x-axis or the j-axis um, describes the inner loop, and, and the, the i-axis describes the outer loop. And so obviously, explicitly enumerating all the computations in a program well, it's, it's very general because you can describe an arbitrary program, but it's also a lot of data. If you have a really big computation, you don't want to explicitly list all the computations that are performed. So we need a way to actually reason about this more efficiently, find a concise way to, to describe the set of iterations. OK? So what would be a concise way to describe the set of iterations for anybody not knowing what I'm talking about? So half of the people, they, they say this is totally trivial. I have the experience that some other people think this is still surprisingly difficult. So what is the easiest way to describe the set of points? 
for anybody who didn't know it before or didn't think about it. So how would you describe this set of points precisely? Uh, you say it's, it's uh, like textually written, it's an upper triangular of a matrix. Yes. Can you generalize this in some way that you say, okay, let's say maybe it's a different shape, it's, it's, it's still a triangle, but maybe not the upper triangle. Is there a good way to generalize that? Ah, yeah! Very nice. Okay, easy, easy sentence, but it, it's, it's still, it's, I don't know, for some people it's, Obviously, the, it's a polyhedra, and how is a polyhedra described? It's either by a mattress or for people more, more easily to see. It's just a set of constraints. And so the main restriction for those constraints is that they are linear, meaning there's dimensions i and j, maybe uh, variables, parameters n, m, but each of them only um, is used in a linear form. So there's not, never something like i times j. But as, as soon as you have those linear constraints, you can describe sets of points very, very concisely, um, very precisely. And the nice thing about this is this is not only a, a, a very precise description, but it's also an, a model, a computational model that you can actually compute. So sets of polyhedra or a, a union of polyhedra is actually a, a mathematical space which you can operate in. Uh, you will never leave the space for, for a lot of operations, and this is very useful for our transformations. So here, this is a very brief, concise description of this program, and the next thing is now we want to do something useful with this, right? So after we know what we actually compute, the question is, can we make this run faster? And this is, again, this is a super simple example, but I've been told before that other people kind of uh, attended the, the, the talk and, and really wanted to get this clear in the very beginning. So as you see above, um, here, this is again the description of the iteration space, so the description of the actual computations performed in this loop nest, right? It's a triangular iteration space again, and, and this is just the set of iterations. And now the interesting concept is we, we divide here between the actual computation that is performed and the time when we perform the computation. And the time when computation is performed is described by the second uh, relation um, we call it the schedule. And this schedule says, in this very simple case, that iteration i and j is executed at time i and j. So instead of a single dimensional time, you have a multi-dimensional time um, similar to a clock, so hours and minutes, seconds. Um, just that there are infinite numbers of minutes and seconds. Um, so this is very simple. And so now, if you want to improve the, like change the program behavior, want to optimize, for example, for data locality, the only transformation, the only thing you need to actually change is this schedule. So that you change the execution time, the execution order of your program. So if you want to perform a loop interchange, again, a very simple question. How do you do a loop interchange? I, I think you know a loop interchange. And the polyhedral model. Okay, but so the thing is, really, you just um, actually I was too fast. I was really too fast. Uh, no. So even before the loop interchange, so what I flip here is a little bit this i and j with c zero and c one. So even though in this original schedule i and j are actually the same, conceptually the input and the output dimensions can be arbitrarily different. And this is what we use to enable loop interchange. We just switch j and i, and the loop and the bottom it just changes automatically. Right? No, this is very simple. You can do loop interchange. Now you can do something like strip mining, for example. So this is now slightly more complicated. So you actually divide it in one dimension. And instead of um, just saying this is the i dimension, you first go in chunks of four i's, uh, kind of choosing a pl block of computation. And then in the inner dimension, um, you give a more precise definition of the execution time for the elements within the block. So each of the elements in, in the very same block now gets a different execution time, so within the block there's another order. And if you actually uh, look at the code that is generated below, it very quickly gets uh, more complicated that, than you would actually think. So even a simple strip mine um, can, can generate right, reasonable complicated code. And now a transformation so I'm not sure if how many of you know loop transformation, but I suppose you know, know the basics. So what, what commonly people do is something like loop tiling, loop blocking, cache blocking. 
Um, so the idea is here, instead of working on a big um, data set and, and you need to load all data from, from global memory, you, you want to work on a small data set and, and, and first process, load all data into your cache, process the data, um, perform computation and, and store it back. And so you, you, you generate cache blocks and this is also just a simple transformation of the schedule, right? Um, and this is just to illustrate, so instead of having a full iteration space, you actually group this and then you get um, different blocks of computation which you can load into shared memory, uh, in, into, in the, into the cache, perform the computation, and, and store it back. So this is really the, the polyhedral model in a nutshell. There's a lot of different things. This was really the super simple examples. Um, so there, are, I didn't touch topics like um, data layout transformations, um, storage reduction transformations. They are a lot more complicated transformations if you want to perform um, transformation for a heterogeneous system. So typical questions you would ask in, in such kind of like distributed memory systems is if I take a chunk of computation, if I take a block of my computation, um, which data is associated to this computation? Which data do I need to move to a different compute node? Which data do I need to move to a, the private shared memory of a GPU, for example? Uh, such kind of transformations. And, and Poly provides you with infrastructure to ask this kind of questions. Um, we're gonna skip about like how you actually do some of those things, but now go more into what actually Poly is, how it is connected with LVM. Because it's an LVM conference and we really want to know what are the connections, what are the, 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 the yeah, overlap with LVM. Um, so to get to know, or to get Poly, it's very simple, you just go to the Poly website, go to get started, download it, install it. Uh, it it's super simple, you just check it out into Tools Poly and compile as normal, and then you can just load it into Clang, and, and it just adds, it doesn't change the behavior of Clang, it just adds a couple of new compiler flags, which you can, if you want, use to explore poly. Um, and this is very simple, you have a simple matrix multiply, so if you just run LVM, it's a little slower, and then if you run it with poly, so you add another flag, it suddenly becomes a lot faster. This is not <coughs> super surprising because LVM doesn't perform loop tiling, so it doesn't do cache blocking and doesn't get the benefit of, of this um, improved cache, cache usage, but it shows that that kind of poly works. And now just to give you a little bit of the context in LVM. Uh, so LVM has a lot of loop transformations, and most of you probably know the loop transformations, but I just want to put, put it a little bit into the picture. So LVM has, has something I call loop analysis, which is Scala evolution, which gives you information about um, the loop iterators and how they evolve through, throughout the computation. Um, it detects natural loops and it gives you information about control flow regions. So those are analysis Poly relies on to actually understand the loop structure. Then LVM has a couple of transformations to optimize the behavior of a certain loop pattern. <coughs> so to, to optimize the Scala, Scala executions within a loop. And those are all transformations Poly is not interested in. We are happily relying on LVM to do so. And Poly also, LVM also has some, 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 I would say more, more advanced, more actual loop transformations, which is loop interchange, loop distribution, and then different vectorizers. So compared to those classical loop transformations we have available in LVM, Poly is more or less complementary. Um, like, Poly can do the classical loop transformations, um, but, but those are very targeted, and Poly is, is kind of looking for problems where you actually need to look at the, the bigger picture, where you need to maybe reason about the, the order of different loop transformations, or where you want, again, want to go for something like heterogeneous compute. The second are the vectorizers. So this is nothing Poly uh, wants to do. Like, we, are, we don't do vectorization in Poly, or at least we do not want to, um, but we are, Prepare and code in a way that it actually benefits the vectorizer, maybe become more efficient in, in generating code. And this is a little bit the architecture of Poly. So as you know, Poly is an LVM IR pass. So we start from, from LVM IR, just a normal input IR. Then we analyze the IR, look at the IR, and see if there's there any interesting loop kernels we can optimize. So here we look for, for any non-trivial loops. So if you just set the memory, like initialize memory, we'll probably not be interested in looking at it. But if there is a more complicated loop structure, we translate it in our mathematical model. And within this model, 
we, we compute data dependencies. So you actually want to know how the different um, individual computations are connected. What is the freedom and which, what, which freedom do we have to move them around in time to reschedule them? Uh, we can do some kind of dead code elimination or dead iteration elimination. So if some of your computations are not necessary, we can drop them. And then we can do some scheduling, which means we look for an improved execution order. After scheduling, we, we post-process the, the execution order. We, we actually implement tiling. Um, we do not do vectorization, but we do something we call pre-vectorization. So we structure the loop nest in a way that, it, um, that the LVM vectorizers can easily vectorize the result. And then we do code generation. So as you've seen, the, the main mathematical model we reason about is really this cloud of points. And as LVM is not very good in computing clouds of points, we actually need to regenerate an imperative control flow. And to do this, we have something called ASC generator. So there's a full yeah, area of research how to best translate such kind of cloud point, uh, point clouds to, to, to imperative um, control flow. And we just use one of them. And then besides just generating sequential um, IR, we can also annotate or introduce OpenMP parallelism. We can introduce SIMD annotations. Um, so LVM has metadata to, to, to provide information to, to the vectorizers. And this is what we kind of can emit. And then we have a piece of LVM IR that just runs through the normal optimizers. So if you want to know if Poly actually does something, there's a command line called just LVM in general has this remark infrastructure where you can just ask different transformations, optimizations, uh, if they did something, what they did. So you can, for example, use it for the inliner to see if the inliner inlined a certain function. Or in this case, we, we just pass it to, to, to the clang command. And Polly will report that it now found this kind of loop nest and that it's considering this loop nest for an optimization. So if this one doesn't give you any feedback, then Polly was not able to understand or optimize your loop nest. Or it may, may have chosen it may not just be interesting to look at it. And so, so in this case, for example, we have a loop nest where we have a function call um, which we don't know anything about. We could theoretically model this loop nest and, and um, yeah, we could theoretically model this loop nest, because, but because this function call really introduces a lot of dependencies, so there's not a lot of transformations we can do, we normally decide to just not look at it to save compile time. And in this case, we'll actually emit your information that, that says, okay, because of the function call, we cannot transform or optimize this loop nest. Um, so this is for the end user. And if you actually want to develop or play around with Poly, um, in a lot of cases, it's more more interesting if you actually, or you get more direct feedback if instead of talking about the C code, um, you reason about the IR. So, so there are two commands, poly show and poly view all, which um, tell you which part of the IR can be detected. So this is marked as green. And um, if you say poly view all, um, it also shows you parts of the IR we cannot reason about and the little pieces of the IR that explain you why we do not want to process or we cannot process a piece of IR. Um, not sure if I can actually zoom into this one, but it's, it's again, it's a super simple. There are most likely more complicated cases, but um, it's really simple. In this case, there's somewhere a function call, and due to this function call, so we don't see the, you can get a few where you actually see the instructions. In this case, you don't see instructions. But due to this function call, um, we cannot optimize this. And so I didn't put it on a slide, but this in general shows a little bit how we actually decide which part of the IR we want to optimize. So LVM has this region infrastructure, uh, or region info analysis, that, that divides the control flow graph into single entry, single exit regions. So any region which just has a single entering edge and a single exiting edge, or which can trivially be transformed into a region that only has a single entering and, entering and exit edge uh, is, is considered for poly to be optimized. And then we just have a large range of checks we go through to um, understand can we optimize, can we translate the region, can we model it, and is it profitable to do so? So 
this is for a very simple example, it shows you like this is the input code and then you get a, the, the polyhedral representation out of it. So you may see that the, like this formulation you've already seen before. You just have the loop numbers, T and uh, the, the loop dimensions, and they reappear here as I0 and I1. And then here you have the constraints on the iteration space. Okay? This is again the, the set of computations that are executed, performed. All right? And so then, again, we have the schedule, the identity schedule, as you've seen before. And there are the memory accesses for, for, for each yeah, read or write statement here. And so, so interesting to, to, to kind of emphasize again, um, all this information is precise. So anything, at least in the default configuration, anything we model, um, or at least, in, there are a couple of extensions, but in the, the, the most basic model, anything we model, we can give you precise information which memory accesses, memory locations are accessed. So in, in some cases, it, it's very important. For example, if you want to move, again, if you want to move data from, from, from poly to the accelerator and back, um, you can't over approximate the memory you move back because then you accidentally you may overwrite data. Um, and then if we have the polyhedral model, then we can just, this is the easiest way to, to, to run poly. If you don't really do anything, you can just take a C code as an input and then we have a debug flag like LVM actually, I probably didn't show this before. LVM has this debugging infrastructure. We just say, give me the debugging output of a certain pass. So if you provide poly scopes, it provides you with a presentation of the scope or the loop region we can optimize. And if you provide it with poly AST, you get the AST we regenerate after transformation. In the most trivial case, we didn't do anything. But in the more advanced cases, this will be looking a lot more complicated, as you've seen in the tiling example, for example, at the beginning. And, and then we go through the different constructs we support. Um, so Poly supports normal loops, um, but it also supports something called Pressburger expressions. So at some point I had a long slide about what Pressburger expressions are. I dropped it because it seems to be a little boring. Um, but in the end, having a basic understanding of this really under shows you which kind of loops we can transform. So this is basically any kind of affine expression. So i times 10 times i plus 3 times m plus something. And then any kind of normal Boolean expression. So and and or, not, implication. Um, those are all Pressburger expressions. And, and if you kind of try to translate them to C, um, anything this can be translated, uh, you can write as a loop, is supported. Also like packages, different kind of packages, do while loops, um, conditions, data dependent accesses. So this is actually for people knowing polyhedral computation, this is a little bit difficult because as soon as you have data dependent accesses, you actually do not know what happens statically. This is the very first extension, the, the simplest extension we can have where you do not have precise information about the program behavior. And here, strictly speaking, we could not actually model this. But there are like plenty of things we cannot model in LVMIR. And so the easiest way here is to over approximate. And for example, say instead of we know that this data location A of I is actually written by, by this instruction, we need to be a little bit more conservative and say this data location is most like or may possibly be written, um, but we don't know. And this has again a lot of implications. So if you know something is overwritten, you can, can forget all the previous computations, you can eliminate all previous stores. If you are not sure if something has been written, you need to preserve this information. Uh, unstructured control flow, multidimensional arrays, uh, memory intrinsics, and we can also approximate behavior of certain function calls. Um, which is just mostly a listing of what we can do. Um, this is actually, I think, a slide I just, I really like to talk about that, uh, because it, if, if you did, did worked in loop optimization theory and if you looked at, at, at computer science papers talking about loop optimization, you most likely have never seen such kind of loops before or discussed how to optimize them and how to model them. Because normally you really have a normal for loop starting from zero, counting up to a certain bound and performing some computation. But the main goal of poly or the main goal in, in LVM in general to work is to, to work on arbitrary or 
actual real world code you get. And you may say nobody is writing such kind of loops, but I can promise you, after pre-processing, template instantiation, and inlining, almost all code looks somehow like this. And this is the main difference between like working on poly and doing loop optimizations in LVM and doing um, loop optimizations in academic research, where you have very nice proofs, very nice models, but you have no idea how to handle such kind of codes. And the way we handle them in LVM is really, um, instead of trying to syntactically match the different loop pattern, what we want to do is to get an idea about the semantics of the loop. And LVM provides us all this information. It finds loops by just using the loop information parse, it finds the, the loop bounds, the evaluation of, of the, the, the different conditions of the loop bounds by, by asking scalar evolution, which actually gives us closed form expressions of the, yeah, well, the co closed forms, closed form forms of the expressions used in the loop, and we can use them to, to model the loop bound. And the nice thing about this is really that we do not only support very strict, very um, fixed input, but we can actually support, yeah, any kind of point arithmetic, just because at LVMIR level, you always need to reason about this. LVMIR doesn't have specific error accesses. Everything is point arithmetic. So um, you need to find a way to reason about that. And Poly provides that. And so, yeah, I didn't put it on the slide again, but now, taking from this input, you actually get back this higher level abstract interpretation. So you can now, again, apply all those nice um, optimizations, transformations, um, you, you see in a lot of research papers, um, you learn in computer science classes about how to perform loop interchange, but you can do this in almost arbitrary input as long as it semantically fits within the constraints we're working on. And here's one other um, point I want to make. So, so um, in a lot of cases, if you actually use poly, you will see that it doesn't do anything. This is almost the common behavior of poly. And this is on purpose. The default of poly configuration of poly is very conservative, making sure we don't increase compile time and we don't do anything that we are not sure it improves performance. There are a whole lot of transformations we could theoretically do that may be possible and may be profitable, but we do not do this by default. So if you're experimenting with poly and something does not work, or you expect it to do something different, there's a mode we call poly process unprofitable, so even for code where we know it probably we don't do anything beneficial or the code just doesn't run often enough to, to, to be worth optimizing, um, this, this flag will actually force Poly to still do something, to still try to model the loop and, and, and try to get out information. This one simple example of an extension we had, I just said previously, if we have a data-dependent condition, um, Poly, it's, it's slightly outside of the model, so instead of trying to, to reason about those individual statements, what Poly does is actually it's, it's looking at, at, at the control flow graph, and if there's a subset of the control flow graph which is data dependent, um, which we cannot reason about in detail, we'll just over approximate, take this as a black box, and schedule the entire piece of the control flow graph together. Um, there's an optimizer, so it's just a couple of things. Um, but yeah, I want to move a little fast that uh, we get to some interesting things still. Um, the last thing I want to tell you is kind of where we place poly in the pass pipeline, because this allows you to get a better picture of, of how the, yeah, everything belongs together. And so if you know the LVM pass pipeline, some of you may know, some may not, um, it consists of several passes. First, it, it has a canonicalization phase, where it really removes any, any trivial things, does, does early loop unrolling. And the second part of the LVM pass pipeline is, is, is we call it the inliner loop. So it's the loop inliner, and, 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 and then it consists of, of a set of Scala simplifications and very simple loop transformations. It's, it's the, what I call like the Scala loop transformations. And the whole purpose of this inline loop is not to improve the program performance, but primarily to, to, to expose inlining opportunities. And most of the LVMI optimizations are in this inliner loop. There are some optimizations that actually improve performance, but most of the primary goal of this inliner loop is still um, canonic, canonically say, canonically is, is, is to simplify the IR. <laughs> okay, 
and then only at the very end of, of the actual path manager, we have loop factorization, loop distribution, um, and, and basically transformation passes, which complicate the IR to improve performance. And so currently, we run poly at the very beginning, because here the IR is, the, the sim is as simple as possible. Um, this adds a little bit of overhead. It makes input, but it makes it a lot easier to work on the IR. Um, there are a couple of reasons why we do this, um, and, but our current goal is, and if you, you have been at the BOF, you all seen it, uh, to actually move the, the, the poly at the back of the inliner loop. So this is very important if you want to process C++ code, where you actually need a lot of inlining to happen to, to do something useful. And it's also useful for compile time, because you kind of get rid of this additional canonicalization phase and, and can very cheaply try to detect loops and then only spend compile time if you know there's something useful to do. Um, we do some auto parallelization and yeah, this is the first half of the tutorial. I'll give to Johannes for the second half and if there are any questions from your side, I think it, now it would be a good time to kind of take a rest, let me breathe and see if there are any questions from your side. Okay. If uh, you've been provided with uh, different different passes, optimization passes, if you go back to the previous slide, this one? Yeah. So um, if you if you've been provided with like five or six different like loop tiling, I don't know interchange. So do you support phase ordering, or you have fixed sets of orders? Um. So, so the question, yeah, was if, if we actually how if we want to perform multiple loop transformations, loop optimizations, how do we order them? And so there the are two questions. One question is we actually don't need to order them. Yeah, and the reason is the polyhedral model does not reason about individual loop transformations, but it reasons about a schedule. And so a schedule can can express an interchange, it can express a loop tiling, but a schedule can also express something. And this something may not even be describable as a set of classical loop transformations. So the question is, how do we come up with a schedule? Because if you provide me a schedule, there's no phase ordering problem. It's the question, like you give a schedule and we do a one a only single transformation. The benefit of this is actually that because we only do one transformation, we don't have the problem that um, the transformation, like if you write a set of individual transformation passes and over time, the, the, the code gets more complicated and complicated. Will, at the end, the last transformation part actually be able to do something with all the code that got produced before? Um, so so can, kind of this problem, we, we just don't have at all. But the problem, how to derive a good transformation, um, is, is still a question. And, and here, we, we still have some kind of phase ordering problem. Um, so we have, um, I would say, uh, the, the general schedule optimizer we have is this doesn't, it's, it's unclear which transformation it does. It is an arbitrary transformation that improves, for, like minimizes data locality, uh, it maximizes data locality, so minimizes dependence distances, and tries to expose as much parallelism as possible. But this is useful for vectorization, for example. And then afterwards, we have a set of very targeted um, loop transformations, like introducing loop tiling, maybe doing an additional phase of, of interchange, so we don't do that, but we could do that um, to, to improve data lo uh, spatial locality. So such kind of, um, for such kind of transformations, we would have a fixed pass order. Okay, any other question? So you mentioned that uh, you, for the poly, you try to, in some cases, you try to bail, uh, bail out as early as possible, right? You mentioned that the point. Yeah. So I was wondering, when you give, when you get this uh, bailing out point, are you give the poly? Does the poly provide the sensible report information for the programmer to understand why you are bailing out? Or, you know. Yeah. So, so some of this I said at the beginning. We have this uh, 
LVM in general provides this general remark infrastructure where each pass can, can, can give information why optimizations transformations were, were missed. Mm -hmm. And so we use this infrastructure to tell you exactly there is something we do not understand mm -hmm. or we decide this loop is not worth optimizing because we, has, we know it's only executed very rarely. And in case we are bored due to such kind of reasons, we, we give the programmer uh, this information and specifically we provide him with a source code line um, that, that triggered with the kind of, that, that caused the failure to, yeah. to optimize this loop. So for example, if you have a pointer chasing loop, you say, oh, this loop is not a countable loop, something like this? Yeah, we'll say that we don't understand the memory references and okay. that's why we don't okay. process it further. All right, uh, second question is, uh, uh, assume the, po the current the poly is not on by default, right? Assume right. we want to make the poly on by default at O2 or at O3. For at O2, what is your re recommendation? Uh, what is your rep uh, recommendation for if you want to make the default on for O3 in terms of your phase ordering? So I don't think the phase ordering changes, but some of the cost heuristics we can, can tune. So we, are, we, we probably tracks the, the compile time or at least, at, at least the amount of computation we perform while reasoning about the loop nest. And if you, if you want to enable it in earlier transformation, or like in lower optimization levels, you can make those very, very restrictive. And for higher optimization levels, if you are an HPC programmer and you don't really care about compile time, we could make them a lot higher. Yeah. So I propose like that we leave questions now until later or after the talk, because otherwise we may not get through the second half. So, Johannes. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to present two things. First of all, I'm going to present what currently Poly makes, or what makes Poly applicable. And second of all, um, I'm going a little bit into detail into the implementation of Poly. So let's start with what makes Poly applicable. And that's in this graphic, this little, this little um, yellow box, the assumption tracker, which we, which we added to Poly a while ago. And it is different from, like, what it does, it assumes the world is nice, like, like researchers do, and still can perform all optimizations like researcher come up with, but it applies it on real world code, but, and it tries to gap the difference with assumptions and with, um, and with runtime checks that actually like, check that these assumptions hold. So how could that look like? So when we have, when we have a uh, loop nest like this, a two-dimensional loop nest, you probably see that it would be good to do, um, like it takes 15 seconds to execute this, but it would be good to do the interchange because then you get um, these axes of i on the innermost dimension and then you can vectorize it better and so on and so forth. So if you do the interchange, everything is fine. You only execute it for two seconds. However, is this, is this legal? And to reason if, uh, about the legality here um, is to reason about M. Because since you have a two-dimensional array A that has like a row size of M and you access them like somehow in the middle, um, it depends on M if this interchange is legal or not. So you statically do not know. It depends on your input. So what you can do is, what we do is we derive conditions under which such an optimization, such a transformation is actually legal. Uh, Better, let's put it better. Uh, we derive conditions under which our modeling um, expresses what we would like the world to be, which is that every, th every access in an, into, an, um, into a matrix has a unique address and you don't like do overflows in some rows or in some values and so on. And then we just go with those, we, we go with um, transforming everything according to that according to that view of the world, and we generate runtime checks. So we take a lot of assumptions, we take a lot of um, prerequisite um, things, we, for, we, we assume we want the world to be nice and good, then we simplify all assumptions, and at runtime, we, we have like two versions, one optimistically uh, optimized one, and one default fallback one, and then we check dynamically, verify dynamically if all the assumptions hold. So let's do some examples. I, I'm not presenting all of the ones we have, but just the, the most important ones that might be interesting for you. So one of them is alias checking, which is implemented in LLVM for innermost loops. So if you have an innermost loop, it will do some runtime alias check. It will insert runtime alias checks to um, allow the vectorizer to vectorize the whole thing, but only for innermost loops. What we can do is we can do that for like 
whole regions, not only loop nests, but multiple loop nests, regions, and so on. And if you assume that aliasing is not really occurring in practice, that gives you a huge speed up. And we also communicate that information that aliasing is not occurring in this optimized version to LLVM through meter data. So LLVM parsers will profit from that runtime check too. So this is one of the, one of the important ones. Then we have one that actually makes only sense combined with the runtime alias checks. So this is loop invariant code, uh, code motion, basically. So we hoist loads out of a loop. In this, in this part, we hoist the loads of the loop bounds out of the loop nest, which can be done by loop invariant code motion of LLVM or GVN uh, in LLVM2. However, only if there's no aliasing going on. If there might be aliasing going on, LLVM won't hoist. If you don't hoist, you cannot build runtime alias checks because the loop is not, the, the bounds are not statically known. And if you, you, if the bounds are not statically known, you cannot build alias checks. Without alias checks, you can't hoist. So you see the problem. And what we do is we do everything at the same time. So we hoist these checks. At the same time, we actually generate runtime alias checks if, if needed. And therefore, we can, we can um, get away with, with doing that. Uh, obviously, we have to guard some of these accesses such that we don't, do not access memory that is, wouldn't have been accessed otherwise, and so on and so forth. But that should be fine. Lastly, we have an optimization that is, um, yeah, it's not really clear if it, like, it's, if it should always trigger or not, which is, um, if you look at this code, you see that you can do some optimizations with the loop nest, but this print in a debug mode will, will prevent you from doing anything. So a print statement or some, some kind of function call or logging and so on, it will prevent your optimization from doing anything. It's side effects and you're just not doing anything. What we do is we, if we encounter such a function called such a side effect that is guarded by a conditional, directly guarded by a conditional, well, we're going to assume for a moment it's not executed in the code. And we're trying to, like we're building a, um, a runtime check that will actually verify that that print, that that side effect is not executed. And then we can just forget about it and just go on and optimize the rest of the loop nest, the rest of the region. So this is, this is, um, Another check, which actually is like aliasing in this, this check actually sometimes fail. If we run it on spec, on the LLVM test suite, these two aliasing in this check sometimes fail. All other checks we have, which is about like six or seven, um, do not, usually do not fail. So th th these are assumptions that we have to take to be correct, to be sound, but you can be sure that they will hold in regular code. These ones almost always hold. So it's like a little percentage that they actually fail. But so let's assume we have, we have, a, uh, we have a loop nest and we did some, uh, we used some assumptions to optimize it. In this case, we did, uh, uh, we had out of bounds assumptions in the size of the array, such that you access some like a row with a wrong index and so on, so out of bounds here. And we said, okay, yes, no problem. We will take that assumption that you don't do that. We take the assumption M is smaller or equal to 1024. And then we optimize your code. But now the user sees that we took that assumption. So we actually report that to the user with the R pass analysis flag. And he says, okay, I'm not really, I'm not really uh, fond of that because now I have like two versions. I have this version, the optimized version and the other version, but I already know that M will always be smaller than 1024. Th uh, so he can tell us that. That's not a problem at all. So we, we emit information about what kind of assumptions we took. The user is allowed and free and, and able to provide more information, and we will gladly accept that. And then we will simplify our tools, and then, for example, in this, in this example, everything in the original code, we will still do the versioning, but that code elimination will, will remove that for us. So that's like not a problem. It should be, should be fast. So now let me go into detail about um, about the run like how is poly is implemented because maybe some of you are interested in looking into poly using it yourself as, as a compiler guy um, so poly has like one canonicalization pass at the moment in the beginning so this is like passes that change to IR are, are marked in red so there is a canonicalization pass at the moment in the beginning that is run usually by default if you just say 03 poly that passes run and makes things nicer. Afterwards, what we do is we detect so-called scops. Scops is, uh, 
it's a legacy term and it doesn't really apply to everything we do, but still, it's like it's basically the region we analyze and optimize. Let's put it like that. A scope is just the region we analyze and optimize. And the scope detection has a lot of those functions that, that look at a region, that look at a basic block, that look at a branch, that look at a memory access, and just uh, uh, tell you is it is it valid or not, true or false, and you just like iterate, traverse all the regions, and you traverse the, the elements of the regions, and you try to find regions we can analyze, we can represent. It actually detects some, some more things all the time. So when it, when it is finished, Scop info will try to build up the representation, and it will use so-called detection context for that. It's like, I'm not going into that much details, you see, but you get an idea of what's happening. So scop detection looks at all the regions, looks at all the basic blocks, all the instructions, accesses, branches, and so on, and builds up the detection context. For example, detection context um, references things like these loads have to be invariant and those have to be hoisted out of the whole region, otherwise you cannot represent the whole thing because then if you do not hoist them, it's not statically, it's not a static control region, but it's dynamic control. So stuff like that is marked in there. And the scope info is where the mo main representation task is done. So scope info builds the scope, builds the polyhedral representation basically, and every like C++ representation we have around it. So all the things we also need, except like the, the real polyhedral set of points at the schedule. Everything else is there in there too. So let's look into scope info a little bit closer. Scope info has the main part is the scope. Okay, that's the scope is our, our representation of the region in, in our terms. So it has the polyhedral representation, but it has also like links to the LLVM IR, such that we can like argue about it and look at it again. And it has a lot of functionality that allows you to query things, query information. So for example, you have a polyanalyzed region and you get a scope back. So you can ask that scope, give me all write accesses in that region or, or which elements of all arrays are written here. And you get the, the polyhedral view on what is overwritten in that region. Or you can ask, um, give me uh, how many loops are in there, um, the parameters, and so on and so forth. So once this is built, you can ask a lot of questions for the scope. One of which is, give me the scope statements, like um, the actual, give me, the scope statements is where the computation is done. The scope is kind of an umbrella of the whole thing. And then the, each, each statement is what, what we model, uh, or we model a basic block as a statement at the moment. And the statement is where the computation is done. In the beginning, you saw in, in Tobias' part that he had the code, and then he had in the polyhedral world this S. There was just an S with an iteration vector. And this S is basically a statement. So for, for this one computation, you get one statement. In our world, usually what we do is for one basic block, you get one statement. So when you have these scope statements, you can ask the scope statement for the, for the basic block. You can ask it for the domain. Like the basic block, obviously, it's like linked to it. But the domain is what you saw earlier in the, in the tutorial. So when, when is this scope statement executed? Like for what iterations? For example, this is executed for i between 0 and n, and j between 0 and i, and so on. Then each scope statement, like each basic block, if you think in the old ways, has memory accesses, same as before. So it has loads and stores, and we model them as writes and, 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 and reads and may writes, but that's a different story. So let's, let's say we have these memory accesses, and they're part of the scope statement. So each scope statement has a couple of memory accesses, and what they have, what um, in the memory exercise you can see, you can ask them, give me your stride. So you can ask, give me your stride in a in a certain dimension. So you can see how many, or you can count how many um, accesses you have that are stride one or stride zero in in some dimension of your loop. You can ask them about the access relation. You can change the memory layout and just change it there, and so on. Finally. Um, yeah, let me skip that. So how is all, how is all stitched together? We're running out of time, so I'm going through this. Um, so what we've seen so far is everything up to scope info, where we build up the scope, the polyhedral representation together with everything, all the, meta, all the additional knowledge we need because we are like part of LOEM. And from this scope, we want somehow to get to the code generation that will take a scope and will produce this um, versioned IR again. So we, have, we haven't touched except the canonicalization in the beginning. 
We haven't and we will not touch the IR until code generation time, where we'll, we'll do the versioning. But to get there, we have to do two things mandatorily to get there in the first place. First thing is, um, what we have to do is, oh, yes, yeah. we, 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 do, we do dependency computation. So we compute which statement instance is dependent on which, on which other statement instance, and for what reason. So you can say, okay, yeah, um, statement instance SIJ is dependent on statements in this SIJ plus one, because you always read the value of the next iteration, and so on. So you, you run dependency info, and you get like a dependency object, which will give you a polyhedral view on the dependencies. And then you run, uh, you use that, and you use the scop to um, build up an AST. It's, it's called AS, ISL AST here, because it's like called that in the, in the code, but it's basically an, an AST representation. And that AST representation can then, or will then be translated into IR again in the code generation. So this is, this is the short path, basically, through poly without changing that much. So this will perform the, the optimistic assumptions and the versioning, but that's it. So there's no scheduling, no optimization in that sense, no polyhedral optimization going on. If you want that, that's not a problem. You can just, like, which is by default enabled anyway, the schedule optimizer, which is a detour, and it will transform your scope. So it will change the schedule of each scope statement. And it will use the dependencies to argue about legality, and then it will give you a new scope, and if you translate that scope into, um, into an AST, you get a different code. So it looks, might look completely different, completely different at all. So then there's one thing he mentioned, uh, Tobias mentioned earlier, which is usually not enabled by default, so you have to enable it, which is the dead iteration elimination. That will check if some iterations of your, of your region can be just like left out. So if we can eliminate them because they're overwritten anyway, so they don't produce values that are useful later. Um, that actually happens sometimes. And um, I have like a minute. So I have two benchmarks here that like real world benchmarks that we could look at. The first one is this um, BT benchmark on the NASA parallel benchmark suite, the C implementation, um, which uses like, which looks like this and like this, and like this, and then like 300 more of those lines, which is only one file, one function of that benchmark. But pretty much everything else looks kind of the same, except there are some function calls. So you have something like this. So and what people said, polyhedral people looked at it and said, OK, yeah, we can, good, we can do tilings here, and that, that actually gives us a speed up of, of uh, we have tiling and multi-threading. It gives us a speed up of six on eight threads. And that's pretty good. But if you look at that from a general view, so if you want an automatic tool that does something like that, you have to consider a lot of things. First of all, the loop bounds are possibly variant, so they are loaded all the time. So if you want to apply a tool automatically, you need like this invariant, um, um, invariant load hoisting that, that I've shown earlier. Then you have possible out of bound accesses in these multi-dimensional arrays. You have possible execution of non-pure calls, in this case, these timer calls that are guarded by the if time on variable. So uh, <laughs> you have underflows and overflows that can actually happen that are obviously undefined in C, but we are dealing on IR level, and on IR level they are not undefined, but it's just like they could happen, and we don't want them to happen. So there's a lot of things to consider here before you can actually run that in automatically, what now over, nowadays works, actually, with Poly. So at least the modeling works. We don't get the speed up, though. <laughs> so this is, this is how the, um, if you run it and you say R pass poly analysis, you say, it says, okay, it starts, it starts a scope at line 47, it ends at 418, and there's a no error assumption that we do not call this timer function, so we assume that this variable timer on equals to zero. If you, it will al always say, uh, tell you what it, as, what it actually assumed, and so that you can add that assumption to your code if you, if you want to. But it will like version the code with timer, timer on equals to zero and with timer on not equals to zero, which kind of makes sense. It will do inbounds assumptions such that you do not access these multidimensional arrays out of bounds in any of those dimensions, which again is kind of invalid in C anyway, but in IR it's not, and it, it, it's always like a hard thing to argue about. Um, if you then it has overflow assumptions, which are probably never like because on IR level, we kind of sometimes lose information about possible overflows, if they're defined or not. And um, so we get like weird constraints like this. You can just tell it that it will not overflow. You can do something like this. 
Um, yeah, so d we are as good here as LLVM is with overflow detection, so it kind of depends. Um, finally, we, um, the, alias uh, the no alias assumption will kick in and will build runtime alias checks, and it will tell you to use the restrict keyword for your pointer such that we don't have to do that, which is always a good idea. And um, yeah, so just last thing I say is there is Black Skull's Parsec benchmark suit, and I was telling you there's that, uh, that iteration elimination. This is the main parallelized part. So this, is, this outer loop is actually parallelized in the parallel versions of that benchmark. And what you can see is this function that is called is pure. And you always overwrite prices i. And you call it with a pure function call. So you call a pure function and you, over, you write in prices i, which basically means the outer, the outer loop is useless. And if you, if, you, if you run that through poly after inlining, or if you, anal or if you annotate the, the function call as pure, both works, poly will give you a, a speed up that is better than parallelization on sequential execution. So it's, it always depends on, on what kind of code you have, that it makes sense or not. But uh, this, I think, is a nice example to, to finish this. Thank you. So are we, do we have more questions for maybe for the second yeah. part or in general? Yeah. So we have, I think, three to four minutes for, for questions and comments in case there are. OK, I'm just assuming you asked all the questions earlier. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, it was interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm Anakshi from Kotli, and I had a Quick question on the versioning that you mentioned. Um, so, uh, is there some sort of a cost model uh, for seeing when it's applicable or not? Because it, when there's multiple conditions under which you want to version and then it's kind of nested, it's going to have its own effects in the backend in the IR. Uh, so, so two things. First, we only generate um, two versions at most only a, a fallback version and the optimized version. So with all, all assumptions hold in the optimized version, and so there's no explosion when we have to take more assumptions. The only thing that could get bigger is our runtime check, but not the number of, uh, number of versions we take. And second, is there some kind of heuristic profitability cost model? Not really, I would say. There is like, yeah. not really. So, so we have a very basic cost model, um, as I said earlier, which is very conservative. So as we, we, keep track of, we keep track of transformations we're doing, and if we don't see that we did a strictly beneficial transformation, we normally stop doing something at some point. And the second cost model, like the time kind of assumptions we take, we generally only take assumptions which are high, very, very likely to be true. Um, yeah. If you would go for, for some assumptions that are not so likely to be true and you actually need to reason do you want to do them or not, yeah, we probably would need some, some more sophisticated cost model. Okay? <laughs> yeah, Helen? No, I don't know what it is. Uh, I understand the part of uh, building scopes is very depending on, on LLVM, so you have your own way of reconstructing the construction, but then you have you, you are in the standard polydoral uh, world, uh, let's say, so all the tools that you are using, are they from outside? Like, f are they directly taken from ISL? Or do you rebuild your stuff? How do you decide which tools are going to go in poly and or okay. if they, they will fit? Or, yeah, or so this how many people are developing this, etc. Yeah, so this is probably a question like needs a little background from the polyhedral community. So, um, um, no, 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 yeah, yeah, but, but to, to, for people to understand what actually ISL is. So, so a lot of transformations, optimizations, and research, you need a very good math library to actually like derive reason about the program and then perform transformations. <coughs> and one of the math libraries that's very widely used is, is called ISL, which yeah, Alan uses and a lot of different researchers use it. And so the question was, how do we do it at Poly? Do we actually do something ourselves? 
And the answer really is uh, we try to avoid to do any, any work ourselves. <laughs> so um, for two very good reasons. First of all, it's, it's a lot, lot less work to be done. And the second thing is um, it actually allows or makes it a lot easier to, to first transfer research results from, from research into LVM. And second, also for us, if you, for example, do, do again a heterogeneous compute GPU code generation, it's a lot easier to look at generated OpenCL or CUDA code than to look at generated um, LVMIR that's implementing some, some, some GPU kernels. Um, so, so we always, for, for the actual logic of the transformation, most of the logic is actually in a library called ISL, which we ship as part of Poly, but which you can also get outside of Poly and use it. In another tutorial I used to do, for example, in an interactive Python interpreter to play with ISL and, and, and yeah, per, try experiment with it. And that's what you can basically do. And Poly then only provides the very thin interface, maybe a little thicker interface between LVM and this math library, as well as all the assumptions, for example. Everything you need to, to go from LVMR to the nice world, we have in Poly. And a second piece, which is not so much developed in Poly, which we just start developing, are cost models. So ISL provides some heuristics, but if you have more information about your target architecture, we could actually provide this information to, to, to parameterize, to, to drive ISL to generate better code. Um, so, so LVM provides the target architecture in information to, to give information about the target. And the question was, does Poly use it uh, or to which extent? And so today we, we almost do not use it. The very first thing would be to, for example, get information about vectors, vector width and drive choices of our outer loop vectorization with precisely those parameters. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat? Just louder than I say it for other, everybody. Is there any interest in um, shipping this um, as part of a normal Clang install rather than having a separate download to set it up? We, in, Still didn't as if I understood it correctly, if we want to ship it, um, if we want to ship it out with LLVM or? Yeah, so, so it's included by default. Okay, yeah, we would like to get it into LLVM mainline such that it is shipped automatically with LLVM and, and then may hopefully get in, enabled at, by default, but shipping is also is like a step to there, I guess. And um, for now, the only way you can do, you can get it is actually load it and build it with LLVM. So, but that is pretty easy because you just have to, as, it's the same as Clang, just load it into one of the LLVM, like into the tools folder of LLVM, like get the code, and then just say, okay, build it, and it will actually build it with Poly then, I guess, even by default, because if the folder is there, it will say, oh yeah, I know that one. So it is integrated basically the same as Clang, but we want to get into LLVM mainline, so ship with LLVM, which makes probably sense for us too. Yeah, actually also to, to, to add some comments, in, depending on your platform, Poly is actually shipped. So, so I, to my understanding, Darwin, the Darwin um, package repository, for example, is shipping Poly, and we had for a while Debian and Ubuntu packages to be built um, um, for, for Poly as well. So this is, is very simple. You just need to do it. Or like I think Debian got, got dropped at some point, but we, we can add this back. Um, this was mostly an infrastructure issue which we resolved. Um, and, and then the question is really, do we want to enable it by default? And my hope would be that within the six months, maybe within a year, um, we'll probably see a proposal for that on the LV mailing list. Um, but, but if this actually makes sense, it needs to be evaluated by you and our, also by ourselves if, if that makes sense. But, but uh, I think a like, medium term goal definitely is, is to, to make some part of Poly at least um, enabled by default. Cool. So I think we are kind of slightly run out of time, so I think we should close this session. If there are any other questions, you're very much invited to, to contact us here, chat with us, write emails on the mailing list, report bugs, or also just report that you use Poly in some way or that might be interesting to us. I would be very interested to hear that. Um, thanks again for attending the tutorial. Thanks, Johannes, for um, the presentation. And yeah, you're free. I think there's a social event coming. <laughs>